So thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this event and to be supporting Resurgence. Um, I'm here obviously to talk um, from the perspective of meditation and how thinking more about uh, our inner life, our spiritual life, our um, a journey of meditation, how, how this can help us to um, become stronger and more resilient and more able to uh, look deeply into the bigger questions that are facing us. So I think uh, sometimes people view meditation as just a way of relaxing. They sort of lump it together with um, other types of relaxation. And actually it's much more than that. Um, it's not only about relaxing, but it's about transforming. It's about transforming our minds so that we can access our own potential for compassion for wisdom, for being able to have the strength to be a greater benefit to the world. I think the, the crisis that we human beings face is very much about a sort of conflict between our obsession with personal interest versus the greater good. And I'd like to talk about that from the perspective of meditation training. So we all, we all know that we are wrapped up in a culture that is very much about the promotion of personal happiness. And we are constantly fed messages uh, from advertising, from the media, from movies, from TV, from the world around us, um, messages that uh, we should constantly seek happiness. But when one learns meditation, one starts to look at the mind itself and one starts to discover that the, the search for happiness and this constant obsession with personal um, well-being, personal happiness, personal um, gain is impossible because it is the searching that is the problem. The, the more we search for something, the more we are generating the habit of searching. So in that sense, searching leads to more searching. Even if we find something, we've already created a trend in our psychology of searching. So we're never satisfied. And of course, this, this key, um, problem in human life is the very thing that advertising and consumer, um, the consumer machine has latched onto as its um, way of keeping the wheels turning, make us feel constantly dissatisfied and we'll keep searching for more. And so because of this, I think we'd all agree, we, we have created a lot of damage in our own lives. And that damage can be at a personal level in terms of how we interact with others. The more selfish we are, the more damaged our relationships become. And then of course, at a societal level where people aren't pulling together, but they're all running around obsessed with personal gain and not, not so much caring about the greater good. And then of course, in terms of the, the bigger picture of the environment, this is the key problem is that we humans have harmed our environment because of our greed, because of our self-centered approach to living. And I always think it's, it's not enough just to tell, tell people that greed is bad and greed is the problem and we need to be less greedy because that becomes very suppressive and very judgmental. I think what's really exciting about the meditation journey is that one starts to discover that the happiness one was seeking from the things around one was already there within one's own mind. So one learns how to tap into one's own internal resources instead of constantly um, abusing the external resources that our planet has 
which are limited, which are incredibly limited. And the more we abuse them, the more uh, suffering ensues. So through meditation, we're learning that happiness is a trainable skill of the mind. It is a state of being. It's very much to do with how we work with our own thoughts, how we function mentally, how, how we relate to our own minds. And it also has a great deal to do with compassion, it has a great deal to do with connection. The more isolated we become, the more obsessed with ourself, with the ego, with what the ego wants and doesn't want, the more dissatisfied and unhappy we become. When we learn to connect with others in a more unconditional, loving, kind and compassionate manner, that really is the key to happiness because we're learning to be less drawn into the prison of the self, the prison, I call it a prison as if we're sort of locked in a cage, uh, pacing this cage, uh, not finding satisfaction. Whereas on the other hand, the more we can honor and respect the interdependence between ourself and other beings and the planet, the more compassion arises. And that compassion is fulfilling. It is something which creates happiness for ourself and of course for others. So I think the, the, the idea of happiness and compassion as skills that we can train is very much central to the meditation path. And of course, I'm speaking as a Buddhist monk, but one doesn't have to be a monk, one doesn't have to be Buddhist, one doesn't have to follow any kind of philosophy or religion. Uh, meditation is for everybody. It, it is a, a training of the mind that uh, everybody, religion or no religion, can, can benefit from. And I think the, the, the main point here is that the meditation practice itself teaches us how to be kind because the meditation practice has within it, inbuilt in the practice, is a learning or a, a training in self-acceptance, which will then naturally lead to accepting others. And this, as I mentioned earlier, is all about how we deal with our own thoughts. So I meet many people who have tried meditation and then they, they report that they found it enormously difficult or they even hated it or well, they felt like a failure, they felt they couldn't do it. And when, when I discuss with people, well, why do you say that? Why, why do you feel that? They usually say, well, it's because I sat there trying to meditate and I just had so many thoughts. My mind was just busy, 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 lots of thoughts, and I felt like a failure. Now, I think that that's based on a, an idea that many people have, which is, they think meditation is about clearing the mind, emptying the mind. They see it as a, a, like a blank space where you, you go into this space where there are no thoughts. So then of course you try to meditate and there are lots of thoughts and then you feel like a failure. And actually the meditation session becomes quite aggressive. Aggressive in that we sit there feeling constantly annoyed with ourselves constantly annoyed with our thoughts. Uh, we're trying to meditate and then we feel like a thought has sort of come in and, and messed it up and we want to push that thought away. So it's a quite a harsh and aggressive experience. But I think it's important to understand that meditation is not about clearing the mind. It's about generating awareness generating greater awareness of our minds, thoughts or no thoughts. And the, the initial stages of meditation, the, the first few practices that one learns are all about learning how to be less controlled by the thoughts so that one can learn to kind of step back and be, be more in a state of awareness or observation. But to do that, we, we often will use a technique such as focusing on our breathing. I think that's a meditation technique most people know about. You're focusing on your breathing. And what happens is that your mind will wonder, there will be thoughts. So you're focusing on your breathing and then the next moment or moments later, you realize that you got completely lost. 
you, you, you had started to think about what you're going to cook for dinner or politics or whatever, the mind just wanders and then you realize your mind got lost. Now, that moment of realizing that your mind had wandered, that is meditation. That is one key aspect of meditation because what's happened is we were lost in a kind of um, dream of thoughts and now we've come back. Oh, I'm supposed to be meditating. So my awareness is back. So that moment, which many people take as a moment of failure, you know, the, the mind wandered and they think they got it wrong, actually is a moment of success because you're back, you're back in the awareness. So you notice your mind had wandered and then you just gently bring your attention back to your breathing. And it's that noticing and returning that are the very things that make us strong because they're changing the dynamic of how we relate to our thoughts. We're learning to step back and be able to observe. We're learning to not get so sucked in and dragged into the thoughts. We're not trying to block them. We're not seeing them as a problem. We're simply bouncing ourselves back into the breathing. And then the mind gets lost again, and then we come back. It's that returning again and again that's the key point. So thinking in this way, thinking of meditation in this way as the thoughts are not a problem, in fact, they are part of the solution, is a very healthy way to view meditation. When I say they're part of the solution, I mean it's because our mind wandered that we can come back to the breath. If this coming back to the breath is the thing that makes us stronger, we have to have somewhere to come back from. So the thoughts that took us away are not a problem. They are helping us to notice and return. So this internal attitude, which I've been describing, generates a sense of kindness. We're not battling with our thoughts. We're not at war with ourselves. We are gently letting the thoughts be, not, not pushing them away, not running off with them, but just leaving them be. That, that is a, that's a kind of unconditional acceptance of the thought. You're not trying to change it. You're not trying to remove it. You're not jumping in it and trying to make it bigger or stronger or better. You're just letting it be and coming back to the breath. So you can see how in the technique itself is is a training in unconditional compassion, acceptance, just loving, loving the thought as it is and not trying to change it, but instead just letting it be, come back to the breath. So in the meditation technique itself, we are, we're building this sense of gentleness, kindness, acceptance, compassion. And this can help us to become less grasping and less angry with ourselves and angry with our minds. And then this quality of kindness can start to uh, manifest in our lives. So it all starts with a thought and then manifests. We're training our minds so that our lives will become more the manifestation of loving kindness and compassion. And I think that's uh, a really helpful way to look at meditation practice. I think it's also very helpful to, to start a meditation session and also end the session with a moment where one generates a very strong intention of compassion. So I will start my practice by spending a moment generating the wish to benefit all sentient beings. So I spend a moment, almost you could say, dedicating my practice to the benefit of all. So. I'll spend a moment thinking I'm going to meditate for my own benefit, of course, but the benefit of all beings at large as well. And then one will do the session, 10 minutes of meditation, 15 minutes, however long one is practicing for. And at the end of the session, there's a sense of, again, dedicating, taking a moment to think, now I've done my meditation practice and I'm dedicating this to the benefit of all beings. So you might ask, well, how does that actually help anybody? Well, I think it helps others in two ways. One is that the meditation practice itself is making us stronger, 
more wise, more compassionate, so that our lives and our actions will become different, but also Im imprinting this intentional aspect, intentional aspect of the session, starting with a motivation of compassion and ending with that dedication of compassion. This is training ourselves in the intention to help others. In terms of our brain, we are reactivating, we are activating the motor cortex repeatedly, the motor cortex being the part of the brain that deals with intentions. So we're building the intention of compassion session after session. So that will naturally then become our intention in life. And so meditation can become the resource that we tap into to help us find more that we can give to others, more kindness, more compassion, and less greed, less wrapped up in the self, more thinking of the community. And of course, these qualities of mind are what we need so badly in today's culture, especially, and in today's environmental crisis, of course. And so now we, we all find ourselves in this, this year of, of um, worry and anxiety, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic and lockdowns. Here in, in England, they're apparently announcing another sort of lockdown today. So for some people that's very terrifying. And of course, one has to acknowledge that for many people that's economically very dangerous and uh, frightening and people suffer. Um, but I, I would suggest that there may be a way to see lockdown as a meditation retreat. So to, to use this time when we're stuck at home and spending more time with ourselves, to use it for spiritual regeneration so, so that we can use this time to train our minds and we can start to see what's happening to us in our lives as things that can generate more compassion. So for example, we're washing our hands and wearing masks. Why, why are we doing this? Uh, is it to help us? Is it to help others? It's sort of both, it's interdependent. And I read somewhere that wearing the mask protects others more than it protects us. So that's a sign of compassion and love. One puts the mask on so as not to harm others. And then one trusts others to be wearing a mask because they don't want to harm us. So we, our compassion is meeting in the middle. So in one sense, we feel very separate, socially distanced, wearing masks, not touching anything, washing our hands. In one sense, it's very isolating, but the mentality behind it can be compassion. If I wash my hands, am I washing my hands because I don't want to catch the virus? Or am I washing my hands because I want to stay clean so as not to pass anything on to others? There is both, both can be at work. So the situation we're in is showing us how interdependent and interlinked we all are. So even though it's a terrible situation and people are suffering and many have died and many have got sick, I myself got sick, I got COVID in March and <clears throat> got incredibly ill. And so it was a, a horrible experience. So even though this experience is horrible on one level, on the other, other level, it can unlock a deeper sense of connection to the world, a deeper sense of compassion and kindness. So let's use our time to regenerate our minds. Thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's been lovely listening to, to you. Um, you've got a very calming voice and it's it's been great hearing your thoughts. Um, I'm I'm sorry you've you've been ill with COVID and um, at the same time grateful that despite your ill health you've been able to be with us today and I've been like seeing in the chat room apparently there's a news conference the news conference is in about 10 minutes what what advice could you say that we can hold on the good that's come from today the well-being the nurturing stuff before we go into 
the pandemonia, the chaoticness, and have you even, um, I mean, you're a, um, a master, but have you, have you struggled with meditation in these times at all? Well, I'm not a master by any means, but I, I'm a monk. I've been a monk for a, a long time and I've, I always meditate every day. And I found that um, when I was at my sickest, uh, I, I had very, very severe COVID for about three weeks. Um, I found it very hard to meditate. I was just holding on to staying alive. But actually, I definitely found that in the moments of severe hard, sim horrible symptoms, I was able to do little bits of meditation that would then alleviate the fear or alleviate the sense of, am I going to die? One, one would go into a calm state and that would start to calm the symptoms a little bit. So my relationship with meditation ha has been like that. And then now there's a lot of time alone. So there's more time to meditate. And I would recommend to all of the people who've attended this day, to take something forward with them in terms of, well, I think it's all about small moments. You know, you might think, oh my goodness, well, how am I going to just apply all these well-being ideas and how am I going to make this part of my life? It's actually a moment to moment thing. Your day is made up of 24 hours. And in those 24 hours, there can be 24 little moments of well-being, 24 little moments of mindfulness, just a few moments each time. You know, one can just take moment, the odd moment during the day to calm oneself, even in the middle of a storm.